Lesson 1 What happened? Sabbath afternoon, March 27. After the earth was created and the beasts upon it, the Father and Son carried out their purpose, which was designed before the fall of Satan, to make man in their own image. They had wrought together in the creation of the earth and every living thing upon it. And now God said to his Son, Let us make man in our image. As Adam came forth from the hand of his Creator, he was of noble height and of beautiful symmetry. He was more than twice as tall as men now living upon the earth, and was well proportioned. His features were perfect and beautiful. His complexion was neither white nor sallow, but ruddy, glowing with the rich tint of health. Eve was not quite as tall as Adam. Her head reached a little above his shoulders. She, too, was noble, perfect in symmetry, and very beautiful. The Story of Redemption, page 20 Adam was surrounded with everything his heart could wish. Every want was supplied. There were no sin and no signs of decay in glorious Eden. Angels of God conversed freely and lovingly with the holy pair. The happy songsters caroled forth their free, joyous songs of praise to their Creator. The peaceful beasts in happy innocence played about Adam and Eve, obedient to their word. Adam was in the perfection of manhood, the noblest of the Creator's work. Not a shadow interposed between them and their Creator. They knew God as their beneficent Father, and in all things their will was conformed to the will of God. And God's character was reflected in the character of Adam. His glory was revealed in every object of nature. The Adventist Home, page 26. The law of God from its very nature is unchangeable. It is a revelation of the will and the character of its author. God is love, and His law is love. Its two great principles are love to God and love to man. In the beginning, man was created in the image of God. He was in perfect harmony with the nature and the law of God. The principles of righteousness were written upon his heart, but sin alienated him from his Maker. He no longer reflected the divine image. His heart was at war with the principles of God's law. The carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Romans chapter 8, verse 7. But God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that man might be reconciled to God. Through the merits of Christ, he can be restored to harmony with his Maker. His heart must be renewed by divine grace. He must have a new life from above. This change is the new birth, without which, says Jesus, he cannot see the kingdom of God. The Great Controversy, page 467. Sunday, March 28. Turtles all the way down. Men of the greatest intellect cannot understand the mysteries of Jehovah as revealed in nature. Divine inspiration asks many questions which the most profound scholar cannot answer. These questions were not asked that we might answer them, but to call our attention to the deep mysteries of God and to teach us that our wisdom is limited that in the surroundings of our daily life there are many things beyond the comprehension of finite minds, that the judgment and purposes of God are past finding out. His wisdom is unsearchable. Skeptics refuse to believe in God because with their finite minds they cannot comprehend the infinite power by which He reveals Himself to men. But God is to be acknowledged more from what He does not reveal of Himself than from that which is open to our limited comprehension. Both in divine revelation and in nature, God has given to men mysteries to command their faith. This must be so. We may be ever searching, ever inquiring, ever learning, and yet there is an infinity beyond. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 8 Page 261. 
face-to-face, heart-to-heart communion with his Maker was Adam's high privilege. Had he remained loyal to God, all this would have been his forever. Throughout eternal ages, he would have continued to gain new treasures of knowledge, to discover fresh springs of happiness, and to obtain clearer and yet clearer conceptions of the wisdom, the power, and the love of God. But by disobedience, this was forfeited. Through sin, the divine likeness was marred and well-nigh obliterated. Man's physical powers were weakened, his mental capacity was lessened, his spiritual vision dimmed. He had become subject to death, yet the race was not left without hope. By infinite love and mercy, the plan of salvation had been devised, and the life of probation was granted. To restore in man the image of his Maker, to bring him back to the perfection in which he was created, to promote the development of body, mind, and soul, that the divine purpose in his creation might be realized, this was to be the work of redemption. This is the object of education, the great object of life. To honor Christ, to become like him, to work for him, is life's highest ambition and its greatest joy. The Faith I Live By, page 166. All the systems of philosophy devised by men have led to confusion and shame when God has not been recognized and honored. To lose faith in God is terrible. Prosperity cannot be a great blessing to nations or individuals when one's faith in His Word is lost. Nothing is truly great but that which is eternal in its tendencies. He whose soul is imbued with the Spirit of God will learn the lesson of confiding trust. Taking the written word as his counselor and guide, he will find in science an aid to understand God. Selected Messages, Book 3, page 310. Monday, March 29. In the image of the Maker. In the creation of man was manifest the agency of a personal God. When God had made man in his image, the human form was perfect in all its arrangements, but it was without life. Then a personal, self existing God breathed into that form the breath of life, and man became a living, intelligent being. All parts of the human organism were set in action. The heart, the arteries, the veins, the tongue, the hands, the feet, the senses, the faculties of the mind, all began their work and all were placed under law. Man became a living soul. Through Christ the Word, a personal God created man and endowed him with intelligence and power. Above all lower orders of being, God designed that man, the crowning work of his creation, should express his thought and reveal his glory. But man is not to exalt himself as God. The Ministry of Healing, page 415. Adam was crowned king in Eden. To him was given dominion over every living thing that God had created. The Lord blessed Adam and Eve with intelligence such as he had not given to any other creature. He made Adam the rightful sovereign over all the works of his hands. Created to be the image and glory of God, Adam and Eve had received endowments not unworthy of their high destiny. Every faculty of mind and soul reflected the Creator's glory. Endowed with high mental and spiritual gifts, Adam and Eve were made but little lower than the angels. God's Amazing Grace, page 40 the whole natural world is designed to be an interpreter of the things of God. To Adam and Eve in their Eden home, nature was full of the knowledge of God, teeming with divine instruction. To their attentive ears, it was vocal with the voice of wisdom. Wisdom spoke to the eye and was received into the heart, for they communed with God in His created works. Counsels to Parents, Teachers, and Students, page 186. The lost coin in the Savior's parable, though lying in the dirt and rubbish, was a piece of silver still. Its owner sought it because it was of value. 
so every soul, however degraded by sin, is in God's sight accounted precious. As the coin bore the image and superscription of the reigning power, so man at his creation bore the image and superscription of God. Though now marred and dimmed through the influence of sin, the traces of this inscription remain upon every soul. God desires to recover that soul and to retrace upon it his own image in righteousness and holiness. The Ministry of Healing, page 163. Tuesday, March 30. God and Humankind Together He who created man and who understands his needs appointed Adam his food. Behold, he said, I have given you every herb yielding seed and every tree in which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for food. Genesis chapter 1 verse 29, American Revised Version. Upon leaving Eden to gain his livelihood by tilling the earth under the curse of sin, man received permission to eat also the herb of the field. Genesis chapter 3 verse 18. Grains, fruits, nuts, and vegetables constitute the diet chosen for us by our Creator. These foods, prepared in as simple and natural a manner as possible, are the most healthful and nourishing. They impart a strength a power of endurance, and a vigor of intellect that are not afforded by a more complex and stimulating diet. The Ministry of Healing, pages 295 and 296. If men today were simple in their habits, living in harmony with nature's laws, as did Adam and Eve in the beginning, there would be an abundant supply for the needs of the human family. There would be fewer imaginary wants and more opportunities to work in God's ways. But selfishness and the indulgence of unnatural taste have brought sin and misery into the world from excess on the one hand and from want on the other. The Desire of Ages, page 367. Every blessing bestowed upon us call for a response to the author of all our mercies. The Christian should often review his past life and recall with gratitude the precious deliverances that God has wrought for him, supporting him in trial, opening ways before him when all seemed dark and forbidding, refreshing him when ready to faint. He should recognize all of them as evidences of the watch care of heavenly angels. In view of these innumerable blessings, he should often ask, with subdued and grateful heart, what shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits toward me? Psalm 116, verse 12. Our time, our talents, our property should be sacredly devoted to him who has given us these blessings in trust. Whenever a special deliverance is wrought in our behalf, or new and unexpected favors are granted us, we should acknowledge God's goodness not only by expressing our gratitude in words, but like Jacob, by gifts and offerings to his cause. As we are continually receiving the blessings of God, so we are to be continually giving. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 187. In our labor, we are to be workers together with God. He gives us the earth and its treasures but we must adapt them to our use and comfort. He causes the trees to grow, but we prepare the timber and build the house. He has hidden in the earth the gold and silver, the iron and coal, but it is only through toil that we can obtain them. While God has created and constantly controls all things, He has endowed us with a power not wholly unlike His. To us, has been given a degree of control over the forces of nature. As God called forth the earth in its beauty out of chaos, so we can bring order and beauty out of confusion. Education, pages 214 and 215. Wednesday, March 31. At the Tree in the midst of the garden near the tree of life stood the tree of knowledge of good and evil. This tree was especially designed of God to be the pledge of their obedience, faith, and love to Him. 
Of this tree the Lord commanded our first parents not to eat, neither to touch it, lest they die. He told them that they might freely eat of all the trees in the garden except one, but if they ate of that tree, they should surely die. When Adam and Eve were placed in the beautiful garden, they had everything for their happiness which they could desire. But God chose, in His all-wise arrangements, to test their loyalty before they could be rendered eternally secure. They were to have His favor, and He was to converse with them and they with Him. Yet He did not place evil out of their reach. Satan was permitted to tempt them. If they endured the trial, they were to be in perpetual favor with God and the heavenly angels. The Story of Redemption, page 24 When God made man, he made him rule over the earth and all living creatures. So long as Adam remained loyal to heaven, all nature was in subjection to him. But when he rebelled against the divine law, the inferior creatures were in rebellion against his rule. Thus the Lord, in His great mercy, would show men the sacredness of His law and lead them, by their own experience, to see the danger of setting it aside, even in the slightest degree. The warning given to our first parents, In the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die, Genesis chapter 2 verse 17, did not imply that they were to die on the very day when they partook of the forbidden fruit. But on that day, the irrevocable sentence would be pronounced. Immortality was promised them on condition of obedience. By transgression, they would forfeit eternal life. That very day, they would be doomed to death. Patriarchs and Prophets, pages 59 and 60 Through the work of the Spirit, the divine relationship between God and the sinner is renewed. The Father says, I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. I will exercise forgiving love toward them, and bestow upon them my joy. They shall be to me a peculiar treasure. For this people whom I have formed for myself shall show forth my praise. The Father sets his love upon his elect people who live in the midst of men. These are the people whom Christ has redeemed by the price of his own blood and because they respond to the drawing of Christ through the sovereign mercy of God, they are elected to be saved as His obedient children. Upon them is manifested the free grace of God, the love wherewith He hath loved them. Everyone who will humble himself as a little child, who will receive and obey the word of God with a child's simplicity, will be among the elect of God. Our High Calling, page 77 Thursday, April 1 Breaking the Relationship When Adam and Eve were placed in the beautiful garden, Satan was laying plans to destroy them. In no way could this happy couple be deprived of their happiness if they obeyed God. Satan could not exercise his power upon them unless they should first disobey God and forfeit his favor. Some plan must therefore be devised to lead them to disobedience that they might incur God's frown and be brought under the more direct influence of Satan and his angels. It was decided that Satan should assume another form and manifest an interest for man. Satan commenced his work with Eve to cause her to disobey. She first erred in wandering from her husband, next in lingering around the forbidden tree, and next in listening to the voice of the tempter, and even daring to doubt what God had said, In the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. She thought that perhaps the Lord did not mean just what he said, and venturing, she put forth her hand, took of the fruit, and ate. It was pleasing to the eye and pleasant to the taste. Then she was jealous that God had withheld from them what was really for their good, and she offered the fruit to her husband, thereby tempting him. Early Writings, pages 146 and 147 After Adam and Eve had partaken of the forbidden fruit, they were filled with a sense of shame and terror. At first their only thought was how to excuse their sin before God and escape the dreaded sentence of death. When the Lord inquired concerning their sin, Adam replied, 
laying the guilt partly upon God and partly upon his companion. The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. The spirit of self-justification originated in the father of lies and has been exhibited by all the sons and daughters of Adam. Confessions of this order are not inspired by the divine spirit and will not be acceptable before God. True repentance will lead a man to bear his guilt himself and acknowledge it without deception or hypocrisy. The humble and broken heart, subdued by genuine repentance, will appreciate something of the love of God and the cost of Calvary. And as a son confesses to a loving father, so will the truly penitent bring all his sins before God. And it is written, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, pages 637 to 641. The mercies of God surround you every moment, and it would be profitable for you to consider how and whence your blessings come every day. Let the precious blessings of God awaken gratitude in you. You cannot number the blessings of God, the constant loving kindness expressed to you, for they are as numerous as the refreshing drops of rain. Clouds of mercy are hanging over you and ready to drop upon you. If you will appreciate the valuable gift of salvation, you will be sensible of daily refreshment, of the protection and love of Jesus. You will be guided in the way of peace. Sons and Daughters of God, page 340. For further reading, Education, Science and the Bible, pages 128 and 129, and Patriarchs and Prophets, The Plan of Redemption, pages 63 to 70.